This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash quality culture. Why, the porpoise can communicate telepathically, Miss Mellon. If we can transplant- It's been kind of difficult for me to pinpoint just why I love the 1999 film The Iron Giant so much. Obviously, it's a story that, through its lifelike characters, touches on our shared sense of humanity in a concise yet poignant way. Perhaps a tad underappreciated compared to other animated films of the time, probably because it bombed at the box office due to lack of marketing, I nevertheless consider it a classic, a masterpiece in storytelling. If you don't already know, it's about a boy named Hogarth in 1950s Maine who discovers a recently landed 50-foot-tall robot alien in his small town. We follow their growing friendship as Hogarth teaches the giant about humans, life and death, and what it could all mean. Set during the Cold War and its accompanying fear of conflict and destruction, it's unfortunately a film whose subject matter has remained painfully relevant for many people. I've procrastinated heavily on writing this, since it's hard to perfectly articulate just what it is that makes this film so special, just how it manages to gently capture all the things that make humanity beautiful with a huge robot alien voiced by Vin Diesel. But since I can't do it perfectly, I'll just do what I can. It turns out The Iron Giant, like many films, is actually a loose adaptation of another work. In 1968, poet Ted Hughes published The Iron Man, a novel reworked from a story meant to comfort his children after his wife Sylvia Plath's suicide. It's pretty different from the Iron Giant story we know, including the ultimate climax where the giant partakes in a test of strength against a monstrous space angel dragon. The differences are covered pretty thoroughly in this video by Cinefix. But the point is, director Brad Bird drew inspiration from its core message of becoming whole again after being destroyed, especially considering Bird's own experiences with grief. The notion of being in pieces and pulling yourself together again was a poetic way to make sense out of something that was so difficult to withstand. There was some healing aspect to that story and I was drawn to it. Maybe because I was still trying to, you know, draw together my own pieces after the death of my sister. Before Bird signed on, The Iron Giant was originally supposed to be an animated musical, likely due to Disney's epic success with this formula in the 90s. But Bird decided to take it in a different direction, and honestly, I'm glad he did. That's not to say I don't like musicals, but something about the gravity of this story, the nature of its subject matter, I don't know, I think periodically inserting songs would have taken away from the weight of it all. It's like how in 1998's Mulan, there are no more musical numbers in the film after her unit discovers the charred remains of a village and their fellow soldiers who'd been massacred. There's a real tonal shift from that point on, and the lack of singing was meant to contribute to that shift. It's no surprise Bird wanted a similar serious tone, considering he was also tackling matters of war and death in his version of The Iron Giant. He'd pitched Warner Brothers with a singular idea. I came back to Warner Brothers in front of the heads of the movie division. I have a different take on it. What if a gun had a soul and didn't want to be a gun? Bird's sister had died from gun violence, lending to this central idea. He wanted a narrative opposed to violence, opposed to war, especially one that children could easily understand. And what better way to convey this than setting the film in the midst of the Cold War era, when paranoia was heightened and everyone was on edge, thinking we were on the brink of nuclear Armageddon. Without warning. Not only that, but set in a time and place that's often pointed to as the idealized version of America. It juxtaposed the picturesque image of 1950s suburbia with the actual truth of the time. Everyone was scared shitless. Time to duck and cover, the bombs are coming down. Duck and cover. And science fiction and comic books reflected this. Bird noted, the main setting looks Norman Rockwell idyllic on the outside, but inside everything is just about to boil over. Everyone was scared of the bomb, the Russians, Sputnik, even rock and roll. This clenched Ward Cleaver smile masking fear, which is really what the Kent character was all about. It was the perfect environment to drop a 50 foot tall robot into. Maybe it was a Sputnik or a... An invader from Mars! That, that's, that's what it is! It's an invader from Mars! Like most alien stories, The Iron Giant does a pretty good job of making you fear the mysterious monster along with the protagonist. Similar to when I would watch the first 20 minutes of E.T., knowing what awaited in the tool shed, it was difficult to watch Hogarth trudging into the unknown without feeling this strange sense of foreboding. But even when overwhelmed by this fear, Hogarth made the choice to save the giant. And this is what the crux of the film boils down to. Our choices. Hogarth, Hogarth, a lonely
lonely small town kid chose to befriend the giant. In a later scene, he teaches the giant about weapons and the finality of death after a deer is killed by a hunter. Dead. Dead. Originally in the scene, the giant killed the deer himself, but the writers correctly surmised that was probably too much and revised it. In this moment, he had his first lesson on the difference between life and death, and how weapons could bring about that change in an instant. It's dead, understand? They shot it with that gun. Even the autumn surrounding them suggests a period of decay, a transformative phase between one point and the next, between being and not. Speaking of these autumn backgrounds, I'm gonna go on a bit of a tangent for a minute, but the art in this film is spectacular. And this isn't a they don't make them like they used to rant, because there are plenty of beautiful animated films still being released, and those art styles have value too. I guess I just miss the painterly style of 2D animation, especially when it comes to backgrounds. It might very well be nostalgia talking, but there's something soothing about the simplicity yet delicate beauty of painted backgrounds and illustrations. I think it's also one of the reasons the Iron Giant's still holds up so well. The aesthetic just naturally fits the time period the narrative is set in. The colors and style were inspired by Norman Rockwell, Edward Hopper, and N.C. Wyeth paintings, along with 1961's 101 Dalmatians, which all makes a lot of sense for this time period's look. I also love animation's potential for motion. It can be so dynamic and fluid, even down to facial expressions. The giant himself is 3D animated, which helped capture his heavy mechanical movements and stiff poses, but they used a program to wobble his lines to make him look more 2D. They clearly put in tons of effort, especially considering the time crunch and budget they were working with. I mean, with all the production issues, it's a miracle the film turned out so well to begin with. Bird said the trade-off for the constraints was creative freedom, that it was, quote, fully made by the animation team. It was not a committee thing at all. We made it. I don't think any other studio can say that to the level that we can. Bird even declined studio suggestions to add characters like pets or sidekicks for merchandising purposes. Anyway, animated films are incredibly difficult to make and the dedication isn't lost on me. So I just wanted to take a moment to appreciate the team. Animation in general isn't really respected as a medium for storytelling and is usually dismissed as kid stuff. Sure, The Iron Giant can be categorized as a kid's movie, but there's not a single note of condescension in it. In a 1999 Animation World magazine interview, Bird said, I'm interested in showing that animated films are films first and animation second. We want to have something for adults as well as children. Animation is storytelling. Storytelling can be anything. Hopefully, The Iron Giant is a step in that direction. I'm glad it's starting to catch on in the mainstream that stories told through animation can be just as valuable and worth our appreciation. And the fact that animation is sometimes even more suited to the delivery and tone of particular stories. It seems like there's more experimentation with styles, even mixing 3D and 2D like the Iron Giant did. So yeah, I hope to see a lot more animated stories like this that appeal to all kinds of audiences. Okay, tangent over. One of the most notable changes Bird made to the original story is the addition of characters, particularly the government agent Kent Mansley and the beatnik artist Dean McCoppin. The beatnik movement through the 50s and 60s stressed artistic self-expression and anti-conformity. Think of that stereotype of people dressed in black with berets and sunglasses, snapping at slam poetry in smoke-filled clubs. For the most part, they weren't taken seriously and were deemed pretentious and pseudo-intellectual. So in every sense, they were basically proto-hipsters. Some people think the beatnik is merely a bum with sunglasses, but he is more than that, though not much. Still, Dean was the cool guy who did his own thing and stood up for what he felt was right. Don't worry, kid. Look, it's not my style to report a guy to the authorities. Meanwhile, Mansley is a stereotypical character we've grown pretty familiar with over the years. The self-important government agent trying to move up the ranks. I'll get you evidence. And when I do, I'm gonna want a memo distributed. Hey! I want to note the government and military aren't necessarily all painted with the same brush here. The general seems like a reasonable guy. Hold your fire! The boy's alive? It's a trick! Launch the missile! Are you mad, Mansley? Anyway, the reason Dean and Mansley matter so much is they serve to show a polarity of attitudes. Dean is level-headed, patient, kind, while Mansley's the personification of the country's insecurity, masking fear behind displays of power. Foreign satellite, Hogarth, and all that that implies. I don't know what it is or what it can do. I don't feel safe, Hogarth. 
Do you? These character differences leaked over even to children. Hogarth is like a younger version of Dean, using reflection and empathy to inform his choices. He even repeats Dean's words to the giant later on. They don't decide who you are, you do. You are who you choose to be. You are what you choose to be. You choose. Choose. Meanwhile, other kids were largely influenced by fear, like Mansley, as they'd been taught that going on the offensive was the only sensible option. The Russians, the Chinese, Martians, Canadians, I don't care! All I know is we didn't build it, and that's reason enough to assume the worst and blow it to kingdom come! We've probably been sent by foreign enemies to take over the country. We should bomb it to smithereens before it does. So, there's this dual reality we have to come to grips with in our awareness of the world. Because on a base level, we know war is a bad thing that we don't want to happen. Yet war has always existed and will probably always exist. And this dual reality also exists internally, with both our good and bad qualities driving our choices. The essence of these two characters exists within us, too. They represent our best and worst qualities when it comes to matters of connection and understanding. After all, people usually can't be neatly arranged into categories of good and evil like comic book superheroes and villains. We're a blend of both, and we have to regularly choose which one wins out. I'm reminded of something writer and civil rights activist James Baldwin said. Walk down the street of any city, any afternoon, and look around you. What you've got to remember is what you're looking at is also you. You could be that person. You could be that monster. You could be that cop. And you're to decide on yourself not to be. Granted, we can't be the best versions of ourselves at all times. We're human and make mistakes. But to care for one another is also human. War has always existed, but so have the helpers. So have the rebels against unjust regimes, and the people hiding refugees or sneaking them across borders. The forces of hatred, apathy, and destruction have always been challenged by love and sacrifice. I am not a gun. And I think that's why the scene of the giant flying at the missile to save the townspeople hits so hard. One scene I wish they'd left in the original cut is the giant's dream, which got transmitted to Dean's television. The scene has since been re-added in re-released versions. It not only made Dean's fear and mistrust later on make even more sense, He's a weapon. A big gun that, that walks. But it also displayed the giant's biggest fear at that point, to be a weapon that brought death and despair upon the planet. It's this idea of obvious innocence paired with the impulse of violence. We also get a glimpse of where the giant's possibly from. But even with this sequence, Brad Bird was reluctant to delve too far into the backstory, saying, pretty soon it becomes a movie about a warrior race of robots and not a movie about a boy and a giant metal man. It was more important for me to make the giant emblematic of our own situation on Earth, where he really doesn't know where he came from or why he's here or where he's going. And we don't either. It turns out the giant's occasional aggressive behaviors were a defensive response. Violence in response to the potential threat of violence, like Mansley. In humanizing the Iron Giant, he's given the same choice between good and bad and having to choose between the two. Atomo versus Superman. No, Atomo. I Superman. In general, he's able to suppress his weaponized programming, only going into full rage mode when he thought his friend had been killed. But when Hogarth appealed to the gentle side of his nature, his newfound humanity, the giant let that side win out. As Brad Bird put it, I think people connect to the idea that we all have dark and light sides within ourselves and that our lives are defined by which side we act on. We all have the power to affect those around us and that can be either a destructive or an uplifting thing. And according to these principles, the giant chose to sacrifice himself to save the town from the nuke. You stay. I, go. I know I'm not alone in saying I can't watch this part without tearing up. Superman. One thing about this part recently occurred to me. Hogarth had taught the giant about the concept of souls. Souls don't die. Mom says it's something inside of all good things that it goes on forever and ever. 
The giant made his final choice knowing it was the good thing to do. So considering what Hogarth taught him, as he faced the missile he believed his soul would live on forever. And I guess he essentially did, in more ways than one. Like I mentioned, the Iron Giant flopped at the box office because of a woefully lackluster marketing campaign. In the midst of this apparent failure, one of my favorite directors gave Brad Bird a call, seemingly predicting the impact the film would ultimately have. I remember Guillermo del Toro gave me a call. What I said to him is, look, in the light of the box office, the audience, the numbers, you feel like a loser, but this will pass. You have made a classic. It will stay in the hearts and minds of anyone that sees it. They would honestly live forever. And speaking of beautiful films with lasting impacts, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video, Mubi. I mentioned James Baldwin earlier, and I'm going to recommend a couple documentaries you should definitely see, including the one I clipped from. Mubi is a curated streaming service, a place to watch beautiful, interesting, incredible cinema. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. Like I said, right now I've been really interested in James Baldwin and his work. He's just, in my opinion, one of the most eloquent writers there's ever been and speaks on the nature of love and belonging and race in such a profound and captivating way. The documentary I Am Not Your Negro focuses on the 30 pages of a book he was working on before he passed away. He'd been writing about his personal connections with civil rights icons Martin Luther King Jr., Medgar Evers, and Malcolm X, along with the stories of their rise and fall. The documentary weaves in narrations of these past Passages, along with interviews and lectures by Baldwin, all serving to illustrate the trajectory of the civil rights movement and how it still affects us today. Then there's Meeting the Man, James Baldwin in Paris, a somewhat more intimate portrait of Baldwin and his thoughts, ideas, and motivations, including narrations and clips of when he lived in France. But it also gives a curious peek at the thorny process of making the documentary, since Baldwin was hesitant to continue, seemingly because he wanted to avoid being misunderstood or misrepresented, wanted to portray things on his own terms with his own voice. If you want to check out these documentaries or the hundreds of other unique films in Mubi's catalog, you can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash quality culture. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash quality culture for a whole month of great cinema for free. Thanks again so much for watching, take care, and I'll see y'all next time. Bye! <laughs>